This story is probably one of the most familiar stories or parables, not just in Christianity, but really all across the world. Matter of fact, Charles Dickens famously called this parable the greatest short story ever written. You know, this story, as we read it, as Pastor Miller read it a short time ago, we often refer to it as the, the parable of the prodigal son, okay? And uh, it's, the word prodigal is not necessarily in the text. We'll see in just a minute that um, uh, there's some translations that use that idea of riotous or wasteful living, um, has the idea of being, living a prodigal or wasteful life. I, I used to think when I heard the idea of the, the prodigal son, I would think of the far country or the wayward lifestyle of the prodigal son. And that's not necessarily what that word means. Uh, prodigal actually has the idea of being recklessly spendthrift or being recklessly extravagant. And this passage, and we're going to see in just a minute, that yes, the younger brother did um, waste his life in this reckless lifestyle or this riotous living. And, and he is, uh, it, is, it is probably right to call him the, the prodigal son. But we're going to see that Jesus is not just focusing in on this younger brother, but in reality, he's focusing in on both of his sons. And that's why I've titled this message, The Parable of the Lost Sons. This father had two sons that were far from him. Uh, This father had two sons that did not love him, only wanted what the father had. Now, I'll say this, as you read, as we go through this text, the points are very easy and pretty basic. We're going to look at the younger son, we're going to look at the father, and we're going to look at the older son. But I pray that the Holy Spirit of God would press into our hearts the areas that we find ourselves in this story. I've heard this preached many times, even as a young man in college and all throughout my life. It seems like the main emphasis is the prodigal son, the wayward son, and um, the loving response of the father. And that is a huge part of the story, but it misses the, the application of the story if you forget about the older son. Now, I've even heard pastors, I think, uh, perhaps maybe reading it into a little bit much, where they'll, they'll talk about the wayward son, like if you have a child that's, that's not living for you. And, and I've even heard pastors, I, I don't know, I, I, I kind of cringe with this, and, and they kind of put themselves in the place of the father. I'll, I'll say who's the father here. God is the father. We fall into one of these sons. It's, we're, we, we are going to, you're going to see yourself. This passage is a reflection of our hearts. This, this passage of scripture shows us either we're going to be a lot like this younger son, distant away from the father, or we're going to be the self-righteous younger son, the older son, uh, seeking to gain favor from the father by doing all of these good works. And neither one of them had the heart of the father. This passage of scripture, we find ourselves in one of these two sons. God the Father is the perfect one lovingly drawing us back to himself. I want us to see, first of all, the younger son. The younger son. Both the younger son and the older son missed what it meant to be a true son to the father. Uh, They wanted what the father had, but they did not care about the father. The passage of scripture that Pastor Miller just read, he said, and he said, this is Jesus speaking, a certain man had two sons. That's why we've titled this the parable of the lost sons. Now, why is Jesus giving this parable? It's important to remember, if you go to the beginning of chapter 15, if you'll go there real quick with me, then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. It is very important. Jesus was attractive to sinners. Jesus did not condone sin. Jesus did not excuse sin. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. But those who were ostracized, those that were looked down upon in the religious society, came near to Jesus. Jesus was surrounded with people who would very easily be fit in this younger brother. They were tax collectors. 
the extortioners. They were open sinners, and yet they felt comfortable to come and to hear of Jesus. Now, there was another group that came and saw what was going on, and that was the Pharisees and the scribes, the self-righteous religious leaders of the day, and they see what is happening. They see this this crowd gathering around the Lord Jesus, and they're murmuring, thinking to themselves, justifying themselves, saying, well, they murmured, this man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. It's important to understand in in, uh, the Middle Eastern culture of that day, to eat with someone was a sign of intimate fellowship. Uh, We go to a fast food chain and you'll sit uh, and eat uh, next to somebody or you'll invite somebody to lunch and it might just be like, hey, just want to grab lunch real quick. But there was a sense of, of intimate fellowship. And so when you sat down to eat with somebody, you were either eating with somebody that you associate yourself with or a high dignitary that you wish you could be associated with. And the Pharisees saw Jesus and said, how dare he eat with publicans and sinners. So Jesus then begins, uh, gives a parable of this lost and found. He begins by talking about this lost sheep that had gone astray, and the shepherd goes and finds him. And then this woman who loses a coin only to search and find him. But then we find in the text of Scripture that we are today the climax of this story. You might imagine the Pharisees are kind of thinking to themselves, okay, that makes sense. If you lose a sheep or lose a lamb, you're going to go out and find it. If you lose a coin, you're going to try to find it. That, that seems honorable. And Jesus begins this story. He says, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of the goods that falleth to me. This young son believed the lie that if I will pursue uh, uh, freedom from all restraint and good, if I can get as far away from my father, I will find joy and freedom. But what he found was ultimately bondage and sin. And he comes to his father and he says, Father, give me the portion that I deserve, my inheritance. This would have been exceedingly disrespectful. It's disrespectful today, but it is far more, it would have been far more disrespectful in the patriarch culture of the time of Jesus because for a young boy, a second born to come to a father, he is literally saying, I wish you were dead. See, an inheritance happened after the death of the patriarch in the family. And in the the structure of that time, the firstborn son would receive two-thirds of the blessing or two-thirds of the inheritance. And then from then on, the, uh, I mean, double, he would receive double. So in this scenario, the firstborn son would receive double what the rest of the sons have. But this this father has two sons. So the older son would have received two-thirds of his inheritance. And then the younger son would have on the time of his father's death, received a third of his inheritance. But he comes to his father and he says, Father, give me with disrespect and disdain and hatred to the father. He says, I want free from your restraint. I want to do my own thing. I want to discover myself. I want to indulge my life. I want to be released from this. And that would have been incredibly scandalous. But what happened next was even more scandalous. This father, because of the Old Testament teaching, would have at least slapped his son across the face and probably disowned him. But that's not what this father did. This father, understanding his relationship and his love for his son, he divides the portion unto him. He divided unto them his living. The word living there is the word bios. It literally means his life. And we don't think of it in our life now, but some people, their their money is their life. It wraps around there. But their livelihood, their, their land and the possessions that they owned were who they were. It was their identity. Uh, Matter of fact, in Old Testament law, families actually never fully lost their land because the year of Jubilee would be reset. Land was very important. Property was very important. 
And so this father lovingly divides up the inheritance and he gives to his younger son this living. Now, don't miss this. Verse number 13. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. What is happening here? You see, it's not that the father goes to the bank and withdraws one third of his money and gives it to his son and says, be on your merry way. No, he would have painstakingly divided his land and his possessions and his livestock, all that he had and and portioned off one third for the younger son. And then the younger son begins in the next few days putting that stuff on Craigslist. He has to liquidate it. He's not going to walk around with sheep and and goats, and and he's going to try as fast as he can. Not many days after, he's going to try and liquidate all of this to to be able to uh, have this money to go as far away from the Father as possible, to run away and to waste his uh, life and inheritance with this riotous or wasteful, reckless, abandoned living. This act by the younger son would have been the epitome of disrespect and dishonor to a father. This father would have been very well known. As we read in the text, he's a very wealthy man owning much, and he would have been very well known and established in that culture. And it's not uncommon for something like this to happen. And the, the younger son of if, 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 if a child leaves and causes dishonor to their family, they would actually hold a funeral that's why at the end it says he was dead and now he's alive. He was once dead. He was dead to our family. He had, he had fallen away and now he's back. It's a, it's a picture of resurrection. So he gives his son this one third of his inheritance and his son then gathers it all together hastily, probably uh, selling the, this possession and lands pennies on the dollar just so that he could get away from the restraints and the restrictions of the father and he ran away. Perhaps you know in your life there are times, perhaps you're right now, your heart is so far from Jesus All you want to do is is to release yourself of of the rules and the regulations, and you want to discover yourself. You want to indulge yourself, and you think that true freedom is to remove all restraints and all restrictions, and and true freedom is going to be when nobody tells you what to do. But in reality, that only leads to bondage. Well, he's living it up. He's living it up. The Bible says he goes into a far country for any Jewish person that what that word, that phrase would have known is, is you're not just leaving your home, you're leaving your culture, you're leaving your religion, you're leaving your established place. You know, the Jewish people were a people of a, of a, of a land, of a place. They, they left this into a far country. He's obviously going into a Gentile country apart from God, apart from uh, a relationship with Jesus. He's running away as far as he can to get away from his, his, his heritage. He wants to get away, thinking that that's going to give him joy and freedom. And he spends it all. He wastes his inheritance. He gets to the point when he uses the last dollar, the last coin, the scripture says, and when he had spent all, that wasn't the end of his story. By God's sovereign grace, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Pastor Miller mentioned in the life of Elisha that that thought of, whoa, hard times. As Pastor Miller was pre- preaching on the fact of a famine, we're in America. Praise the Lord. We are blessed. Uh, God, and most of us don't have to wonder where our next meal is going to come from. But I, I remember in like a small way, although it was a wrong fear. It was maybe a phobia. But when COVID came, you remember all the grocery stores were like, and we're like, I need to go stock up on beans. And, and you buy a whole bag of beans and never make beans because we never make beans. And uh, you think, oh, I'm gonna, I got to do this. I got to have rice. So we bought like more rice than you could ever eat for the rest of our lives and uh, uh, we're still eating some of that rice I'm pretty sure but you when you have nothing and famine comes that's when your heart starts to sink you know when when COVID hit I was blessed to have some money to to go buy extra rolls of toilet paper 
I don't know why we got into that toilet paper thing. We try to put that out of our mind. I forget about those days. <laughs> but there was a famine in the land. And he didn't have anything. And he goes from bad to worse. He goes to the, the rock bottom. And the scripture says that he went and he joined himself to a citizen of that country. And that citizen sent him in a field to feed swine. It's so important for us to remember this. The, the, in the Jewish culture, there's nothing worse than pigs. They were unclean. They're unclean, like physically unclean, but they were ceremonially unclean. For him to even be around him, he would have been unclean, have no opportunity to worship God. But he says he comes and he joins himself to a citizen of that country. This Gentile person, he basically, as a beggar, wraps his arms around him and says, save me. And that man says, I want you to go out into the fields and I want you to feed swine. And he was so hungry, the Bible says that he would fain have filled his bed. He, he longed for the very husk. These, these would be um, uh, carob, uh, carob pods. They would have been used to feed um, pigs and swine to, to get them to be all fat for harvest. And, and even the poor would eat these things. It was these little pods that had little seeds inside. And he wanted even the husks of those. He desired them so bad. But no one would even give to him. He hit the rock bottom. He had tried to live his life thinking that if I will just squeeze out all the pleasure of this world, I'm going to be free. But he, it led him to bondage and misery. At this point in the story, the Pharisees and everybody around, although they would have gasped to hear the, the grace of the father even dividing his inheritance, oh my goodness, they're thinking... This guy got what he deserved. If we're honest, in our hearts, we sometimes think that. We say, well, yeah, he got what came to him. He, he deserved this. He dishonored his father. And this young man, in that state, decides, I'm going to get religious. Listen to what he says. He was hungry. He was starving. He wanted to eat pig food. Verse 17. He came to himself. And he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare and I perish with hunger. I will arise, go to my father, and say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. He thought, if pleasure won't give me deliverance, then I'm going to find a way to earn my way back to the father. You see, he would have wasted one third of the inheritance of his father. And it would have been very common in that time period for a boy who shamed his culture, shamed his home to come back and beg and live as a hired servant by with pennies a day, scraping by to try and to earn a status just to erase the debt. But that son would never have an inheritance. That son would not be considered a son. That son would simply be a hired servant. And when he finished his debt, he would go on his merry way, having nothing for his name. The son thought that that's probably the way I can do this. I'm going to earn my way back to the father. Don't we do that so often? We think, if I could just, if I could just do enough, I will earn the respect of my father. I will, I will earn the father's love. We saw the younger son. I want us to see, secondly, the prodigal love of the father. Remember I said the word prodigal does not mean wayward. God is not wayward. God is an extravagant, recklessly loving, gracious God. Our Father is exceedingly greater and more gracious than we could ever imagine 
And this story pales in comparison to God's true love, but it gives us a glimpse of God's amazing love. He said to himself, I am not worthy to be even called a son. I'm going to earn my way back. I'm going to do what I need to do. He came to himself and he says, I'm going to go to my father and say, I will earn my way back into good standing. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. I am no worth, more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and he came to his father. Imagine what that walk, that traveling back to his homeland would have been like. The shame, the pain, the humility of a life wasted. Potential squandered. This boy at this time would have been ill-clothed, barefoot, walking the desert road back to his hometown. And we get to see this amazing, loving father. He rose, he went to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him. And he had compassion. That word literally means to be moved within you. A gut-wrenching feeling. And the Bible says he ran and he fell on his neck and he kissed him. As I was studying this passage this past week, that verse alone brought me to tears. You have a father longing for his son's return, wisely waiting to know that he'll turn back and have true repentance and come back. This son did not understand God's grace. We don't understand God's grace when we come back to him. We come back with this idea, I'm going to fix, I'm going to pull myself on my brood stacks, I'm going to do everything. But the Bible says that he, a patriarch of the family, fathers in that time period did not run. I feel like we should bring that back. I'm not a fan of running. So, um, but they had a reason. They wore robes. In order to run, it would have required you to take that robe, to hike it up, to gird up your loins. It would have exposed your bare legs. It was a form of humiliation. Young boys, young men would run. Soldiers would run, but not patriarchs. We see a father running to his son, filthy and dirty. He wraps his arms around him. He embraces him, and he begins to kiss his son. This is not a father asking for retribution. This is not a father asking for payment in return. This is a father coming alongside of, loving him, kissing him, showing him that he, his love is eternal. And you know, this son, he's, he, 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 I think he has good intentions. You know, he's got good intentions. And he, he's walking down this road. He's, he's memorized his speech. I'm not worthy to be called your son. Can I just be one of your hired servants? I will pay back everything I owe and I will be out of your life, but I just, I'm hungry, I'm tired, I'm broken. The world has chewed me up and spit me out. I'm coming back because I know that you are a good and gracious father. And he's, he's, he's recited that. The father, he kisses him. He falls on his neck in a, in a, it, it, you got to understand in that day time period, like I, I, I love, I'm a very uh, huggy kind of guy with my kids. And I think fathers should hug and, and kiss on their kids and, and tell them, especially sons, you need to uh, bless your children. And, and I, but that's not what they would have done in this time period. It would have been uh, the fa- the son would have come to the father and, 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 and bestowed this kind of love. But this, this boy who's, who's filthy and stinky and unclean. A, a swine herder, he wraps his arms around him. And so the son, you know, is trying to interrupt. He says, Father, uh, he's, he's, he's prepared this speech. You got to love this guy. I sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. The father ignores him, completely ignores him. Because the father knew what he truly needed is to be reminded of who he was. He was the son of the king. He was the son of the father. He needed to be brought back into that right standing, in that right relationship. And what did the father do? The father said to the servants, bring forth the best robe. 
and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. What is he saying? He says, I want you to go get the best robe. This is fascinating. I did a lot of research on this. I read quite a few uh, uh, commentators, a couple of books on, on this story. And it's just, this is a vast resource of, out there. And you can plumb the depths of this story. There's so much here. It's really, we're just hitting the tip of the iceberg. I almost thought to split this up into like a couple different sermons, but we're trying to get to the end of Luke in, by Resurrection Sunday. So give us grace, okay? We're going to go a little bit longer today, but please give us grace because there's so much here. He gives him, he says, go get the best robe. The best robe would have not even been something that the father would have worn. Why? He says, go get it. This is the robe that he would have kept in his, his closet for the very specialist of occasions. This would be a, a dignitary, a very, very important person coming. They would often let them wear it. Or maybe the, maybe the wedding of the firstborn son. He says, I want you to go get this robe before the son has a chance to go take a shower Like, you ever do yard work and you just get filthy dirty or you're just doing, you're doing mechanical work. I don't do mechanical work, but I'm sure it would make you dirty. And you're oily. What, what do you want to do before you throw on your Sunday best? You want to wash up. But what was the father saying? I'm, I am going to bestow upon you honor. Some commentators believe the reason why the father ran is he was trying to intercept the son before the shame of that community came upon him. There would have been hissing and murmurings and darts. But when the father came and embraced him, that community is like, whoa. The robe would have, would have represented honor and restoration of status. The ring would have signified authority. He's given the father's ring. This is the ring that you would press in uh, with, uh, with, with wax to, to, to confirm something. It would be your, the, the authority of the, the family. And he says, get this man some shoes. You see, slaves in that time did not have shoes. He says, you are not a slave. You're a son. You are not, you are no longer dead. Now you are in full fellowship and restoration in this family. And then he goes beyond that. He says, let's have a feast. Let's bring hither the fatted calf, kill it, let us eat and be merry. We are going to party like we've never partied before because my son was dead and now he's alive. Now to own a fatted calf, you would have had to be very wealthy. I don't want to like um, insult your intelligence, but calves, they turn into cows, okay? They're not calves very long. For a family to have a fatted calf on ready that would have been a, a very, very difficult thing to do time-wise. I was reading commentary and just kind of in my mind thinking, you know, this younger son and the bitter anger that he has toward it. And this fatted calf was oftentimes used for a big celebration or festival or wedding or something like that. And perhaps this, younger, this older son thinking, this is, this, is, this is waiting for me. I'm making But this father almost had this, this, this calf ready, ready for this moment to, sh to pour out this lavish, reckless, fully spending until you have nothing left on this son. Why? Because he said, my son was dead. He is alive. He was lost and he is now found. And they began to be merry. They were celebrating. He didn't make this a shameful thing. He didn't bring back the past. He didn't say, well, you know, you know, you did this and I'm telling you, you got to do all that. No. This picture is a picture of God's gracious, amazing love. But what's, what's missing in all this? Up to this point, you can even imagine that the Pharisees are just blown away. It would have been scandalous up to this point. But Jesus then goes right to the lost older brother. The Pharisees probably would have thought, this man is insane. Why would he do this? Why would he do so much for this younger son, extravagantly forgiving and restoring and giving all this beautiful metaphors of pictures of his love? And they, they can't understand this because they thought that the only way to get God's favor is to do what is right. In other words, by living a righteous, self-righteous life, then I'm going to entitle myself to God's blessing and God's favor. And that's what Jesus really presses in on. He says, now the elder son was in the field. What's he doing? He's working. Of course he is. 
He is, he is painstaking. He is, he is giving up his life. I mean, he is just a hard worker just doing. Jesus radically changes what we think of sin in this passage of Scripture. Because in the outward, everything the, the younger son did, that makes sense. He wasted his life. He lived with, with harlots and prostitutes, we find out later. He did everything that was wrong. But the older son was just as far away from the father, even though his geographic distance was not as far. His heart was just as far, and it was more deceptive because he did not truly love the father. All he wanted is to control the father to get what he wanted. The elder son was in the field, and he comes and he draws near. This shows the vast uh, expanse of this father's uh, uh, land and wealth. He was coming from a far distance, working a hard day, and he hears dancing and music. He calls to one of the servants. This, again, there's so much symbolism here. We don't have enough time to go through all of it, but the, the, the son is, he, he, this is been, this, if he had a good relationship with the father, he would have gone straight to the father and say, Dad, what is so exciting that you would think is important to celebrate? I want to celebrate with you, okay? But no, what does he do? He calls a servant. He says, hey, what's going on? The man said unto him, thy brother, very important, is come. And thy father hath killed the fatted calf because he hath received him safe and sound. You know, younger brothers, they feel like they're entitled to what they get. They feel like their self-righteousness earns them a right for what the father has. And they feel like if I can just do all the good things, if I can check all the boxes, God is obligated to treat me in such a way. He was angry and he would not go in. This again is an affront to this father and this father could have simply just said, you're on your own. But again, we see the, the, ra- the, the radical, lavish love of the father. He goes out to this rebellious, hateful son, the son that is far from him from his, in his heart, but he's close to him in proximity. He comes, out to, he comes out to him and entreated him. He's trying to draw him into this celebration. And he answering said to his father, lo, Literally, he's saying, listen. He doesn't doesn't address him as his father. He just says, listen up. These many years do I serve thee. I've done so much for you. Neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. You know what? The the older brothers have a um, self-inflated view of their works. Never once broke the law. I never once transgressed any time, any of your commandments. And yet you never even gave me a kid or a goat that I might make merry with my friends. He didn't say, dad, I want to celebrate with you. I want to get close to you. No, I want, I want, I want what you have so I can get what I want. If you would have killed me a a goat, I would have brought some of my friends together. We would have had a good old time. He didn't want the father. He wanted what the father had. And he was doing the exact same thing, but in a more deceptive way. He felt like if I could just do what's right and and, and earn enough points, then the father owes me. I'm entitled to this. But as soon as thy son was come, which has devoured thy living with harlots and has killed, and you've killed for him the fatted calf. He doesn't refer to him even as his own brother. The servant says, your brother, but according to this son, he's still dead. He's still dead. He said, your son, your son came and you killed the fatted calf. The father says to him, son, thou art ever with me and all that I have is thine. It was meat. It was necessary that we should make merry and be glad for this. Thy brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. The saddest part about this story is that's where the story ends. We don't know what happened to the older son. We don't know because really this story is a lot about our story. You know, sometimes when we hear about the younger son or the older son, we put ourselves in the, in the place and we think to ourselves, yeah, that son, he wanted freedom through self-discovery. He, in other words, he was, all of his outward sins were going to self-indulgence. If I just remove these restraints, I'm going to find peace. And, but the older son, the older son thought that he could find freedom through self-discipline. If I could just work hard, if I could do enough, I'll be accepted. You see, religion operates on the principle 
I obey, therefore I am accepted by God. But the basic operating principle of the gospel is I am accepted by God through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, therefore I obey. It's because of what Jesus has done for me, because of the love the Father has bestowed upon me, because of God's grace on me, then I go out and I live the life that God has commanded me to live. But see, the problem is, as many of us, we find ourselves in one of these two camps. Can I just say this as your pastor? I think most of us, we're here in church, we're trying to live a good life, we're trying to honor the Lord. I think most of us lean into that older brother at times. And we look at people, their lives are falling apart, and we just kind of think, well, yeah, they had it coming to them. But in reality, in reality, God's grace pierces to the older brother, and the younger brother. It's coming to the Father, not so that we can gain from Him or control Him. It's coming to the Father to get the Father, to love the Father. May God's amazing love that is shown in this passage give us the encouragement to walk by faith, to be reminded that we are sons and daughters of God, that He loves us, therefore we want to serve Him. We don't serve Him in order that he will love us. This narrative gives us a picture of two types of hearts. One that seeks, seeks freedom from self, with self-discovery, self-indulgence. And another that seeks freedom or joy from self-discipline or self-righteousness. And neither one of them understand the true gospel. So let us come to Jesus, the one who says that we are saved by grace through faith. It is not by our works. It is because of God's grace. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we